Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We're all in a designated place at the designated time that God has designated for us. Ain't he, ain't you glad he designated you this morning to wake up and open your eyes and see another day? Uh, we're excited because not only is it Father's Day, but it's also Juneteenth. So if you ain't got a reason to celebrate, I don't know what your situation is, but you woke up this morning, didn't you? You started you on your way. He you put breath in your body. And I am excited about what God is going to do in the midst of us today. Is there anybody in the building today who has a reason to celebrate? Did he, did he take you from Monday to another Sunday? That's a reason to celebrate. Amen. I am so excited about what God's going to do today. And I hope that you all are ready for a worship experience like never before. So tell somebody like never before. Yeah, that means that we can't expect what happened last week. We got to expect this God to do something like never before. Amen. Anybody believe God can still do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask, think, or imagine? Amen. I'm excited about another Father's Day. Amen. Uh, let's get prepared to go before the throne of grace as our deacon lead us to the next place. Good morning, Bible Base. Good morning, Bible Base all over the world. God bless us all. Good morning, fathers. God bless you. Happy Father's Day. Let us go in prayer. Blessed Lord, we thank you, Lord, for being with us and keeping us through the week, through the days, through the years, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you've made and all the things that you're doing and all the things that you're going to do, Lord know that we must look to you in all things we have no battle we know that you will take care of us keep us forever focused on you remembering to put you first in all things and always looking up without you we are nothing we give it all unto you in jesus name we pray amen Come on, somebody give God a praise in this place. Our God is great. Our God is awesome. Our God is mighty. Come on, for that we want to lift him up just because of who he is. Come on, he doesn't have to do anything else for us. He just is God. Can we bless him for that because he is the supreme ruler of the universe because he sits high and he looks low we just came to bless him so somebody ought to lift up a hallelujah in this place oh come on just begin to tell him how good he is God you're awesome God you're mighty and God we bless you God we praise you Hallelujah, hallelujah, God we bless you, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, hallelujah. Come on, we came to bless him, how great is our God?
He is, you ought to just begin to thank him. Tell him how good he is. He loves it when we praise him. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. Come on, that means he gets comfortable in your praise. 
we also want to tell him how much we love him. So we just want to lift him up and bless him. Oh, my. 
So I want you to stand up and I want you to just virtually welcome each other and we're going to do a revolve. Remember how we did it last week? And you're going to revolve, you're going to welcome your neighbor, you're going to sing the song, you're going to turn around and welcome the people on the camera, and you're going to keep revolving. Here we go. vision statement. All right? All right, here we go. The Bible-based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace will reach and reproduce within the Tampa Bay and Temple Terrace areas and its surrounding communities a people inspired, equipped with the passion for the truth of Christ and his compassion for others who will be enablers of change 
for the discouraged, the disenfranchised, the disinherited, and the dispossessed. We are Bible-based, Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-led, extending God's kingdom biblically, evangelistically, educationally, entrepreneurially, through expansion, economically, politically, socially, and globally. All right, give yourself a hand. Give yourself a hand. Okay, you may be seated. You may be seated. Now, we've been hearing it. We've been hearing it that today is Father's Day. And so today we celebrate father figures. So, if you have been or are a father, a step-in father, The nation's first Father's Day was celebrated on June 19, 1910. However, it was not until 1972, 58 years later, that honoring fathers became a nationwide holiday in the United States. The idea of a special day of honoring fathers and celebrating fatherhood was introduced by a woman named Sonora Smart Dodd. She campaigned tirelessly for a day to celebrate fathers after noticing all the fanfare surrounding Mother's Day. Dodd and her five brothers were raised by her father, who became a widower after his wife died giving birth in 1898. He never remarried, and he raised his children as a single father. In 1909, at the age of 27, Dodd interrupted her priest during a sermon about Mother's Day. She said, I like everything you said about motherhood. However, don't you think fathers deserve a place in the sun too? No doubt she was thinking about her own hardworking widowed father. President Lyndon B. Johnson issued the first proclamation. Here are a few quotes that you may find your father or yourself in. Fathers are men who dared to place the world's hopes and dreams in their children. When a father speaks, may his children hear the love in his voice above all else. Even the best dads make mistakes but there is no mistaking their love for their children. A father is a man who expects his children to be as good as he meant to be. There is no shame in fear, my father told me. What matters is how we face it. Daddies don't just love their children every now and then. It's a love without end. So fathers, what you teach your children you also teach their children. Margaret, Paulette, Elaine, and I are the daughters of Elmore Green. Some of the names on our father tree are, the, are our dad's dad, whose name was Dan, our mother's dad, whose name was Lindsay, our Lindsay's dad, whose name was Nathaniel, and our dad's granddad, whose name was Thomas you get to call out the names on your father tree. Here is a poem for you, dad. God took the strength of a mountain, the majesty of a tree, the warmth of a summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea, the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of night, the wisdom of the ages, the power of the eagle's flight, the joy of a morning in spring, 
the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depth of a family need. Then God combined these qualities when there was nothing more to add. He knew his masterpiece was complete. And so he called it dad. Finally, fathers, step in fathers, grandfathers, quote unquote uncles and all father figures, we honor you. Your children love you. God created you and you are his. We praise God for you. May you have an amazing and a happy Father's Day. We salute you. You may be seated. God bless you. Glory, 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 glory. Come on, y'all bless the Lord one more time. Come on, we want everybody to join in. It's going to be a congregation of worship. And it's okay if you lift your hands. It's all right if you stand on your feet. But we just want to continue to bless God and tell him how good he is and how much we love him. So why don't you join in with us? Just help us lift up his name. We want to magnify him. That word magnified means to make it great, make it bigger. So we want to magnify Jesus in this place and make him bigger by blessing him. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Oh, because you cared for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Can y'all help me say, I love you? I, I love you. you. I love you. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Because you care for me, because yeah. you care for me, such a special way, such a special way. That's why I, I praise you. I'll lift you up. I lift you up. I magnify, magnify your, your name. name. That's why my heart. That's why my heart is filled with, with praise. My heart and my mind, my heart, my mind, my soul belongs, my soul to, you. belongs to you. You paid the price for me, you yeah. paid the price for me. Way back on Calvary, way back on Calvary. That's why I'm praising. That's why I praise you. That's why I lift you. I lift you up. I magnify I your magnify name. Your Oh. 
at me today because I'm going to share with us passages of scripture that so many people know, so many people have taught it, so many people have preached it. I'm almost embarrassed to ask you to listen at it, but would you please join me and prayerfully tune in to the gospel of Luke chapter 15. It's so familiar. Uh, in Wednesday night Bible study, the members of the that were in attendance, both their faces and and their um, um, names, they thought that they would uh, help me with this uh, passage. And we won't read it all. Matter of fact, it starts with verses one and two. Then we fast forward. Y'all hurry up and get my mic right. Cause we paid a lot of money for that board. You're not supposed to have to touch it. You're supposed to just do it. But we um we uh um we're gonna fast forward past verses one and two, but remember verses one and two is where this starts. And I'm gonna ask you to just hold tight. Uh, and I'll read in your hearing verses 20 through 24. But remember, it started in verse, verses 1 and 2. 
And he rose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But, verse 22, you want to highlight that word and underscore it. That's the way it is in everything I got. That but right there says that the father said to his servants, he didn't say anything to the boy. He didn't say a thing to him. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Why? Verse 24, because this my son right here was dead and is alive again. This my son right here was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, you don't know my father. God bless you. You can have you see the presence of the Lord. You know, that's, that's a good saying right there. You don't know my father. If, if, if somebody uh, were about to uh, misjudge you, if you were thinking clearly, you could say, you don't know my father. If someone mistake, mistook you for something that is out of the bounds of your choosing, you could blame it on your father by saying, you don't, you don't know my father. You could not expect that out of me if you knew my father. Or if, 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 if I know this for a fact, if you tried to convince me that my father would let me down, I would tell you, you don't know my father. I promise you that the occasion of this text begins in verses 1 and 2 after chapter 14 where Jesus had just had his fill with the publicans and sinners. He had had his fill also with the scribes and the Pharisees, and he decided that he would give four pictures, four object lessons. We call them parables, those earthly stories that are aligned against some lofty spiritual teaching, parables. The parables before us, they began in verses 1 and 2. You have uh, the lost sheep. And then you get story number 2, the lost silver. And then story number three, you get the lost younger son. Mm -hmm. And then story number four, you get the lost elder sibling. You ought to see the look on your faces. Story number one is about 
the lost cattle. Story number two is about the lost coin. Story number three is about the lost scandalous son. Story number four is about the lost sanctimonious son. This is a parable. In the parable of the lost sheep, it is the son of God who is the active member of the Godhead. In the story of the lost silver, it is the Holy Spirit of God who is the active member of the Godhead at work. In the stories of the lost sons or the lost son and the lost sibling, however you choose, you might want to stick to the old-fashioned way of just talking about the one son called the prodigal by most people. But this, in my estimation, these are two stories about lostness. All of these stories could be found in God's lost and found department. Like a little boy today opening a beautifully wrapped present on Christmas morning, we are going to now unwrap one of the great stories of the Bible that is dearly loved and treasured by millions of people. It is one of the most well-known stories in scripture, the story of the prodigal son. In the EBM rendering, it is the story of the prodigal sons, because whatever definition you make of the word prodigal, I'll give you one, you will find that it is evident both in the son who was wasting away from home, as well as the son who was wasting in the home. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. See, it's all in how you view what you see. I tell us all the time in observation, you can take this passage of Scripture even now, and you can view it from the loss of the, from the, from the eyes of the younger son. You could view it from the eyes of the elder brother. You could view it from the eyes of the father. You can view it from the eyes of those of the household, the servants and others. Or you could do what you can do and take a view of it the way Luke did. Luke, the writer, and you and I now as the readers must come to grips with this series of stories that Jesus has laid out so strategically and meticulously to make sure that the target audience see themselves and do something about themselves. And thus, the publicans and sinners will see themselves in that younger son and the elder brother will help the scribes and the Pharisees see themselves. The story of the prodigals is told uh, in fewer than 350 words, yet the story never fades like a sun-bleached cloth, never fails to charm uh, like a lovely lady, it never falters to present the compassion of our Savior, and it never finishes to hammer home the majesty of our Lord. Each word in these stories are a priceless pearl of wisdom as it portrays a father's love for his sons. 
Jesus taught us that God is our father and nowhere more so than in the stories of the prodigal sons do we see him. These stories are simply the story of a God as father, he who is known as Jehovah Adonai, Elohim, who is Jehovah El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, the almighty, the great I am, is also father. In fact, Jesus introduced him to us as father. Jesus speaks of God the Father 12 to 15 times in this short pericope, 22 short verses. If we miss God the Father in the text, we miss the whole point of the parables. In the first section of, of three in these wonderful stories of sons, you got to see how to go from living in the house high above the halls and then one who journeys away and lives among the halls and then the one who stays at home outdoors unwilling to come inside with the halls. It's how I saw this story. This section is about trouble and tragedy that torments a person when they surrender to temptation. It reveals to us how quickly we can fall and fail and fumble and flounder when we run away from our Heavenly Father. These parables involve two sons. I told you the first includes the story of the scandalous son. In verses 11 through 24, you get to see him. Then the second, the story of the sanctimonious son. Verses 25 through 32, you get to see him. Men are lost like sons are lost through re rebellion, pride, self-will, and deliberate choice. I tell my grandson all the time, I, I can't tell his daddy, his daddy's in a coma. I can't tell his uncle, his uncle is crazy. And I can't tell, I, but I can tell him, you can make your choices, but you cannot make your consequences. See, I'm going to let y'all in on this because I might forget it. Satan won't tell you this is that sin will reduce you. And that choices always travel with a companion. They just hang out together. Choices and consequences. Choices and consequences. And Satan won't let you in on that, but welcome to Bible base. The parable of the first prodigal, the younger son. See, I can know how to win people over. All I got to do is tell the truth. You, meant, you ever wonder why they didn't include the other brother as a prodigal? Oh, you don't either. Stay tuned. Because the story of the second prodigal, the pouting one, the, 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 the one who wanted to do what the younger one did, but he never had what it took to do it. He thought that he could get over with works. You can tell it when he starts to talk. And he says, all of these years, I'm done nothing but stayed here uh, and done everything I'm supposed to do. Works. Scribes works. Pharisees, you'll get it. One wasteful away from home, the other wasteful in the home. And we can be sure that both groups, the publicans and the sinners, as well as the scribes and Pharisees, easily recognize themselves in the stories. But Jesus does not finish the story concerning the second son. Paul does in the book of Romans. You want to know why, don't you? 
Well, you have to just stay around until the Lord brings it around because the text is tailored to teach us that there were some happenings in the far country. A certain man, a father, had two sons, Jesus said. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. You had not heard it said like that, had you? He said, Father, give me the portion of the money. No, the syntax of the word give me is in the imperative mood. And the imperative mood denotes a command. His, this the young whippersnapper is commanding his father. Y'all ever seen children like that who make demands on their parents? Here is a fella like that in the text who does not ask, may I please have my portion that I won't get unless you are dead. May I please have my inheritance now? I want to get out of here. Hmm. No, he makes this deliberate demand. I call it his, his leaving home prayer. Give me. He'll, he'll have his coming home prayer. Make me. Right now he is smelling himself. You can tell it from the text. Because as the curtain opens, you find this little young whippersnapper impatient, demanding his inheritance while his father was still alive. Give me, he says. Americans used to say, give me liberty. Now, oh, they say it all the time, just give me. We live in a give me society. Don't want to work? Give me R3. Don't want to work? Give me stimulus. Don't want to work? Give me any kind of extra. It's the society, the culture that we live in today. We're in a give me generation. So there is definitely something here in these stories that you and I can apply also. This young son is consumed with self. And there is nothing more worthless to live for than yourself. My, my, my mentor, the late Dr. E.K. Bailey, used to point at us and say, if you are your biggest call, then you have no cause at all. There's nothing more worthless. When you are your cause, when you are selfish, when you are self-centered, it leads to wandering, it leads to waste, it leads to willfulness, it led this boy to all of that, and wild living, and woe. And you're going to see it's not only in the younger son, it is also in his sibling, his elder brother. There it is, the lure of the faraway places that has now taken hold of this younger son's soul. No doubt he was Fed up with the rules, Deacon White was trying to tell us the other night. Fed up with my daddy's rules. Fed up with my daddy's religion. Fed up with my daddy's righteousness. Oh, how he longed to get away from it all. This selfish son swiftly sped away from the security and serenity of his home. The fact that he left so quickly shows us how he could not wait to get out from under his father's watchful care. I know how many of young people who just couldn't wait to get out 
from under parental authority. This young fellow wanted out and wanted to live his own way now. He wanted to live in such a way that he could not live while at home. Not in this house. There is a curfew in this house. There is a, a yes sir and a yes ma'am and a please and a thank you in this house. And the boy no doubt got tired of that. The life of the father was a restraint on the rebellion and wretchedness of this son. This, y'all, is why people sometimes get out of the church because it restrains their fleshly lust. It restrains their fleshly evils. Evil is not comfortable around godliness. If a church is truly preaching Jesus, preaching the Bible, preaching what God says, yes, sinners will be uncomfortable. It ought to be not only uncomfortable, it ought to be convicting. And if you are too comfortable, I pray that God will do something and say something to make you uncomfortable because you cannot be comfortable the way sin is running rampant in our land. And that's great. It ought to lead to conviction. Good preaching ought to lead to conviction. It ought to lead to repentance. It ought to lead some sinner to cry out, I yield, I yield. I can't hold out no longer. And so this younger son approached his father with his heartless demand. In effect, he said, let's pretend that you are dead so that I can receive here and now my share of the inheritance. How heartless. But I love this father because this father does not argue with him. This father does not debate with him. This father does not say, you better go to your room and shut up. This father does not say, you, 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 have, lost, you have lost your mind. Maybe us fathers can learn a little something from this father right here. It's when you have raised your sons and daughters, when you have done your best, when you have poured into them, when you have loved them, lift them, led them. And I, I, I tell you, when they get this away, let's see what this father does. Because I see, I see this father this father far from indignantly refusing the son's outrageous request. He gave it to me. You know, this father reminds me so of God. You know, you know, it, it, God, uh, God will let you do what you got to do. God will let you get to the end of you. And only when you get to the end of you can God even do what God wants to do. Oh, you missed it. As long as you are that strong-willed and as long as you got it like that, as long as you think you can live independently of God, God says, have at it. Because one thing for certain, you'll never know that Jesus is all you need until he's all you got. No amount of pleading and reasoning was going to do that young fella any good. There he is, looking, loving, leading, lifting father. You know how that is. He knows that sometimes no amount of love, no amount of counsel, no amount of the gimme, gimme, gimme. Now, I'm not talking about mothers today because mothers can outgive fathers. Yeah, they are. They are. They are. They are. Yeah. And them boys know it. You don't see the mother in this story because it'll mess up things, yeah. Them mothers, boy, they are no alone ain't never going to be repaid. And they'll loan you the money they borrowed from you. They'll loan you the money they borrowed from you to pay them back. Sometimes you got to raise your children 
and then release them. They may get on your nerves, but you will have to just keep them on your knees. Look at this story, would you? A certain man, a father, had two sons, Jesus said. And the young of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And father divided unto them his living. Luke says in verses 11 and 12, the father gave in. The young fellow would have to find out the hard way what it was like to be away from the father's care, cast adrift in a careless, cold, cruel society. He had been from Bamford Heights. He would have heard these words, want to be grown? Get gone. Because them streets will teach you. And if the streets don't teach you, the system will teach you. That's Bama Heights. The Bible says, and the father divided unto them his living. Literally, this father has poured his life into building his estate so that he might have something to hand down to his sons other than the, the unpaid bills. This father gave his sons everything he had to the little boy, the younger son. He gave the portion that falleth to him of the result and sum total of the father's life and work. The younger son wanted what the father could give him. The younger son wanted what the father had, had ge generated. The younger son wanted what the father had labored for. The younger son wanted... Y'all don't know, know no people like this. Ah. Uh, the younger son wanted what the father had, but he did not want the father. Who that sound like? So many people want what God has, want what God can do, want the way that God can make. So many people want all of that from God, but they don't want God. The lost person takes no thought for God. Their attitude toward God is give me. They want his air. They want his food. They want his water. They want his time. They want his talents. They want his treasures. They want everything. They even want the world. But they do not want him involved in their lives. When God made man, he literally poured his life into man, Moses said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Read it sometime. It's been there the whole time. And every day that men live upon the earth, they consume the resources that God created for them. Yet they do not want him in their lives. They want what he can give them, but they don't want him. What a tragedy. No wonder the Bible calls such people fools. My grandmama didn't, must have didn't know that because she beat me so bad for calling somebody a fool. I had to find it for her in Psalm 14 and 1. I can't never forget that. Because I think I was a fool for Showing it to her. Now, anyway, we, 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 they beat you for anything. You know when you was right, when you was wrong. They, they failed in one area, though. They told me very often, boy, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to beat the black off you. And they beat me every day, two or three times. But one thing I know, Ron, that's one area they failed in. Unless this ain't the black they was talking about. Listen, listen, listen to the prodigal son, number one, his going away prayer. Father, give me. You ever hear people praying sometimes? Lord, you say, come right now. 
give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. <laughs> it was the prayer of a heartless fool here. Not many days after the younger son gathered all together, packed his backpack and took his journey into a far country, verse 13 says. The expression took his journey implies that he went abroad. He wanted to see the world. He wanted to see the great, wide, wonderful world far from the narrow confines of Jerusalem, Judea, and Judaism. He, if he had headed north to Caesarea, about 65 miles away, he could have taken the ship to Myra on the coast of the Roman province of Lycia, a giant step of another 900 miles. From there, he could have sailed on to Rome, landing at Putula. From there, he could have anticipated Paul's route to Rome, heading up the Apian Way another 500 miles or so. Or he could have journeyed to Rome, marching along the great Roman road, the Roman highways, and stopping here and there, posing every now and then, taking selfies, if you will. He could have stopped and then texted them and sent pictures all around the world. He could have said, look where I am. Look what I'm doing. Snapchatting and all of that kind of stuff along the way to sample the world's wicked wares. Or Perhaps he headed for Egypt and then on to Carthage or even Tarshish, a far country indeed. What I learned from the expression took his journey is that one way or another, the distance could have been measured in miles. Oh, but when you take another look at it, that is not how they measure distance going to or coming from the beckoning shore of the far country. Corinth, Carthage, Crete, no, the distance measured by God was expressed in terms of morals, not miles. The distance into the far country is measured by the distance between a person and the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke tells us the son took a journey into a far country. When you run away from your heavenly father, the journey can end up being very far. And what I want to remind you is, is that the far country is not that hard to find. In fact, you can enter the far country right where you are living. You do not have to go to a city known for its wickedness. You can even be a member of a very good church, even teach a Sunday school class and live in a far country. There have been preachers I know who have lived in the far country but preached in pulpits every Sunday. See, 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 the far country. You English-speaking Americans who like to read it, you got to go beneath the surface and understand that the far country is an attitude of a person's heart. It is, it is, it is, the attitude of a person's mind. It is the attitude of a person's soul. It is the attitude of a person's will. It is the attitude of a person's desires. Far country, people that live in a far country from the Father are living in rebellion against the will of God and the word of God. When we look at this story, number one, we find right away that both of these prodigal sons. Now, let me do this. When you look at these stories, you'll find that prodigal sons and daughters can come from the best of families. There are no perfect parents, don't get me wrong, and there are no perfect children. Because we know that Adam and Eve, they had it, they had it going on. They had the perfect father in the perfect environment. 
but they chose to rebel against God, allowing Satan to convince them that the center and citadel of their lives was a liar. And so Eve was deceived and Adam was disobedient. You know the story. Statistics tell us that greater than 60% of teenagers who live home where they were not they were not physically abused. They were not sexually abused. They were not mentally abused either. They just took off. Husbands and wives can be in a solid marriage. and One begins to wander. Children have a will that we can try to mold for good, but we cannot control that will. They make their own choices, especially when they leave home. They are responsible for their choices, mothers. They are responsible for their actions, fathers. They will reap what they have sown in their lives, as we will see when they reap the results of their sinfulness and are addicted to drugs, afflicted by desperados, conflicted with doubt and despair, constricted by difficulties, evicted from their dwelling, inflicted or even infected with diseases and restricted by detention in jail, prison or a hospital bed. God has a way of getting their attention. I tell sometimes when I am visiting the sick and I know the waywardness of a person, I may in our prayer say to God, now Lord, that you have Earl's attention, would you, while you have him on his back, would you allow him to look up to you and see that you are always the one with the last word? God has a way of getting your attention. That which has been catastrophic in one's life can end up being for good when there is repentance and brokenness. To this younger son, Satan did his thing. He glamorized the forbidden. See, he likes to put the bright lights on the entrance ramp. And all that boy could see is, 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 is the forbidden is now glamorized. And then once he gets off the ramp and gets on the highway, what Satan does is he maximizes the pleasures. And once you get past the speed limit, what he does is minimizes the consequences. He glamorizes the forbidden. He maximizes the pleasures. Have any of you all understood the truth that pain will teach you lessons, that pleasure won't let you learn. Well, I tell you, my brothers and sisters, sin will reduce you. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, make you stay longer than you want to stay, and make you pay more than you want to pay. The son got just what he wanted. You read that story again the right way. That younger son got just what he wanted, but soon found out that all that glitters ain't gold, that he had lost what he had. You may get what you want, but you may lose what you already have. The young son took off and began, the Bible says, to waste his life away. Many do the same thing today. He wasted his substance. That word wasted is the Greek word diaskafutso. Uh, just depends on who's teaching the lesson, but it's D-I-A-S-K-O-R-P-I-Z-O. Diaskafutso. Diaskafutso means to scatter abroad. It means to squander, squander. It means to winnow as if you are spreading it around like a person that separates the grain from the chaff by throwing it up high into the air and letting the wind blow away the chaff. This is the way the younger prodigal son handled his resources. He was throwing his substance away. Yeah, you read it. His substance was not only being squandered. His strength, his security, 
his serenity, his sense of somebodyness, his sense of reason. They were all being flushed down the drain. He was living high on the hog, but would soon be living with the hogs. Holy living does not impoverish, but sinful living does. Too many people on the welfare rolls are there because of unholy living, such as booze and immorality and drugs and gambling. Some are there because they choose to be there, but they are too lazy to work. Some of them, I said, many make excuses for not working and can own cars that I can't afford. Many of them have a way of a uh, $2 a month rent payment and they got anyhow if the government wants to improve the economy it needs to improve the character of the nation this young son on the run wasted his substance the bible says on riotous living that word riotous emphasizes waste but it also comes from the greek word sozo sozo from which we get our uh, word soteriology salvation with the greek letter alpha in front of the word which makes it a negative meaning unsaving or not saved he was not saving nothing. He was not saving anything. He was uh, splurging. My daughter, my little baby daughter, say that's a good word right there. I don't know. I wanted to know what the what the what the what the what the what the word is nowadays for having a good time. And she says, "What is the context?" I said, "Oh Lord, you can't even have a, a father daughter conversation unless they got to throw up in your face." What is the context? This young man was so wasteful with time, wasteful with talents, wasteful with treasures, wasteful with things. He lived without any sense of self-control. He squandered his portion. He distributed his resources without any system of accounting for the distribution. He just threw it out there. Does that describe any of us? If so, you are on the hog pen trail and you can get off. But listen, he wasted, the text says, he wasted all his substance with riotous living. What is Luke telling us here? He abandoned himself to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He abandoned himself. The world is against him. The devil is against him. And flesh is against him. Everything external is against him. The world. Everything the devil has to offer him is against him. That's infernal. And then there is flesh. That's internal. There in the far country, we see a younger son throwing his substance away, living in debauchery and surrounded by fast living companions hollering out come on y'all is in the only in the ebm rendering drinks are on me and then you would think that that would be it but here comes the party girls who would add to the fun and frolics of that faraway land, dropping it like it's from the window to the, like RK would say, waiting for somebody to put their key in the ignition. Let your hair down, the boys have said. It's, let it all hang out. What Satan will not tell you is that Sin will reduce you to your lowest term. 
You can choose your sin, but you can't choose your consequences. Wine, women, wallowing, line dancing, slow dragging, necking. You got to look at this text because we saw only the English word riotous living, wasted his substance, far country. Can't you see it? Sin brings separation. Sin brings sadness. Sin brings sorrow. Sin brings sickness and suffering. And if you don't hurry up and get it in check, sin will bring disease and even death, he and they were just having what they called a good time. But then all of a sudden, there was no more money to be funny. There was no more change to be strange. I asked y'all to help me Wednesday night. Man, I wouldn't even on this. Now you got to be a part two and a part three. All of his money was gone. He doesn't have a pot. He doesn't have a place. Everything is gone and everybody's gone. Where are all those friends? Where did he leave family? Why now all of the unanswered texts? Why are there are no followers on his Facebook page? He no longer has any emails coming in. And the only calls he's getting is from spam. Looks bad, doesn't it? That's why I told you to circle that word but. Because when all of it got like that, then God stepped in. God stepped in, I tell you, because a famine came. Probably because of that loving father, that longing father, that lifting father, that living father's Heartbroken prayers, God stepped in. Text says, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. Verse 14, and he began to be in want. Y'all, that, 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 that was God at work. See, I know this. I can't, I, I can't run over famines. I can't, I can't run over COVID-19. I, I can't run over uh, uh, pandemics and endemics and outbreaks. And I can't just look at them and think that they are just there for, for an evil purpose. No, famines were often more times than not God's instruments of judgment and cataclysmic cleansing to be sure the far country is no place to be when your funds run out when your friends take off and famine moves in there are 13 famines in the bible and all of them are significant and this one is significant both for its timing and its tenacity because when you make the choice to live in sin, Satan doesn't want you to consider what is at the end of the road. He just wants you to see the thrills at the entrance ramp to lure you into his snares. The end of the road many times is bumpy, unpaved, or has a dead end. A carnal life eventually leaves you with a famine in your heart. Many spiritually suffer today from spiritual famine. They're barren of spiritual fruit and blessings. 
they are dry, cracked, and spiritually parched because they have neglected to give their heart and ears to the word of God. Time is gone. This was a problem in the days of Amos. Read about him in Amos 8, 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. You and I exiled from the building. and God blessed us to have Zoom and other platforms, virtual platforms, and rather than us getting our spiritual selves more intact, we became apathetic. We became close to anarchy. Don't want to get dressed, don't want to show our face, don't want to speak, don't want to look, don't want nobody to, don't want, don't want, don't want. And it was supposed to make us bigger. It was supposed to make us better. It was supposed to make us bolder. In our text here, 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 when this severe famine hit, the prodigal son, number one, began. Don't miss that word, began. That's not just the English word. Don't Google it, because it ain't going to tell you the truth. Don't ask Siri about this word began because it can't tell you the truth about it because it is not morphologically the English rendering. But I tell you what it'll do if you go back into the language of its origin. It is the Greek word akamai. Akamai is sometimes the pronunciation. A-R-C-H-O-M-A-I. It means to be the first to do anything. It means to be chief or leader. Watch what it means because the Bible is talking about this young fellow who you have labeled as the prodigal son. When you look at that word began, it means to be chief or leader. This young son was the first to be in need. He was the leader during the famine to be without. I don't know what makes y'all shout, but that, ooh, the, 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 he was the leader in being needy. Why? Because he lived each day without the anticipation of tomorrow. He lived for now. He lived for self. He lived for him. He ran away from the father and the tide of this troubles was coming in to shore. You might send it out but there'll be a wind and a wave to bring it back. Whatever you sin, whatever you sow, you can rest assured you will weep. He lived high on the hog He's about to live among and with the hogs. The Bible says he was in want. That word want is the Greek word hustereo. Hustereo, it means to be left behind in the race. So fail to reach the goal. Left behind in the race and to fail to reach the goal. He was left behind. He was first to be in want, and then he's left, yo, God Almighty. Any person who wanders away from God, the Father will experience uh, a spiritual famine in your life. If you run away from the Lord, our Heavenly Father, don't be surprised when you wake up someday and wonder, why am I not happy? Why? Don't I have any joy? Why don't I get my prayers answered? Why am I so cranky? Why I can't stay in a, in a good relationship? Why nobody can't satisfy me? Why am I so bitter and angry and jealous? Why am I so spiteful? You wake up one day and ask those kinds of questions. Why do I have 
constant turmoil and trouble all the time? The answer just may be the fact that you are suffering from spiritual famine and the Lord is trying to bring you back to himself. You may be in the hog pen and not on the trail. I got to close. I ain't finished, but I got to close. This prodigal son is where he wanted to be. He asked for it. He desired to be right there. But now it's not where he wanted to be. His ignorance, his impatience, his insolence, his immaturity, his indifference. I mean, when you get like that toward the father, it'll catch up with you. He has spent everything. Marie, that word spent, don't look at it in the English. Look at it in the Greek. Daphnao, daphnao means to acquire expense, to disperse, to squander, to consume or waste. This son was a consumer, not a contributor, not a producer. He has squandered his substance and wasted his wealth. And there is a price on sinful living. Sinful living is expensive and exhaustive. Sinful living is extensive. It's expansive and excessive. Sinful living is erosive. It's eruptive and explosive. I got to show y'all where I got that you don't know my father from. This son was planning on having a good time. He wasn't planning on losing everything. He wasn't planning on a famine in the land. You never do plan for the rigors of rebellion and repulsive living. The young man, that young man went far enough from the father's presence, but not far enough to escape the father's prayers. Fathers, don't stop praying for your sons. Fathers, don't stop praying for your daughters. Don't stop praying. Fathers, your prayers can do more than your pouting. Your prayers can do more than your punishing. Punitiveness. This boy got in such a bad shape, he looked for a stimulus check. He looked for those who were around when he was bling, bling, large and in charge. Then he went job hunting. I told you God was in this. He went job hunting and no, he had no, he had no vitae. He had no bio. He had had nothing going for him, but he left the father's house. And so he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. In the KJV version, he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, but he perished with hunger. Y'all, he was so hungry that he even fished in the hog's slop bucket and stuffed the muck into his mouth. Working around hogs was an unclean business. And here is a Jewish son, a Jewish boy, and Jews and swine, that don't be in the same conversation. It would seem that even to get such a vile job, he virtually had to force himself on the man who employed him so much for the far horizons. I got to get out of here. I got to get back home, this boy is saying, I can't do this. I got to get back. I got to get back. And he starts to rehearse it to himself. How many hired servants have my father with bread enough to spare? And I perish in hunger. He took a look into his iPad and he looked at the father's house and he see how things are going, how people are joyful and happy and eating and having a good time. And he turned again and says, oh no, how many hired servants 
as have my father with bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. He says, this ain't going out like this. I will arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and I'm no more worthy to be thy son. I want you to take me back. But as a hired servant, I don't deserve to be a son, but I want you to take me back. And now I can see that boy with all of that slop on him. It's smelling all as bad as he could smell. I can see him as he began to get up out of that slop pit, dripping and smelling, dripping and smelling, dripping and smelling. And he took that bucket and banged on the door of that man who had hired him. And he banged on the door and he banged on the door and the man shows up and he comes out the door. This is only in the EBM version. So don't try to find it on Google. He banged on the door and banged on the door. And when the man came out, he looked at him and the little boy says, I don't mean you no disrespect. Thank you for trying to help me. But here's your bucket of slop and I'm up out of here. He says, have you lost your mind? He says, no, I was out of my mind. When you read the text, the text says that he was insane. Because it says, when he came to himself, oh my God, I wish I had time to help you to read this thing. He was insane the whole time he was out there. But praise God, he said, here's your slop bucket, here's your slop, and I'm going home. The man said, hold up. If I was your father, you come smelling like that around me, you come looking like that around me, I'll sick the dogs and the hogs on you. And goodbye, Bible base, because that little boy looked up at him and said, you don't know my father. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care how long you've been out there. I don't care how you smell. I don't care how you've been. I don't care where your britches. I wish I did, but I'm not going to do it. You don't know my father. My father. Hello, boy. I don't know how old he was, neither. But I know he was the younger son. And when he came to himself, he, he started stepping. And as he was stepping, his father was looking out over the horizon. He knew his boy, how his boy looked. His father was looking, and he was looking. And then what had happened was, it was improper for an old man to run. But you don't know my father. He'll flip the script any day he wants to. Y'all missed it. Sometimes you can get so far away that it looks like God has let you leave his presence. No, he's always where you left him. And the Bible says, when he was yet afar off, his daddy ran out to meet him. Ran out to meet him. Boy, I, I intended to do this in an illustration, but I'm already over time, and I'm going to get chewed up. I'm going to get chewed up, but listen, you got to take this with you. He ran out to meet him. He, he, he violated protocol. He ran out to meet him. But then the little boy had rehearsed his, his story, and the whole time he'd been walking, see, that's why I don't like English, because the English shows that he just said it one time. The syntax of that statement says that he kept saying it over and over and over again. He says, walking down the street, ah, Father, I have sinned in the normal word to be called your son. Father, I have sinned against God and before thee, and I'm no more words of that. And if we were walking and not social distance, I'd walk around there and show you the whole trip from the faraway country. He was walking and walking and talking and walking, getting his speech. You ever tried to get your speech together when you knew you was going to get a whooping? You knew you was going to get towed up? You knew they were tearing you high? Only one of us can't talk about it. We never got a whooping. But he, he hit the thing. He, 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 you ever knew you was going to get it? And, 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 and and he just kept talking. He knew that even the discipline of the father 
was better than the dredge out there with the devil. Listen, listen, listen. He, 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 his father ran to him and, and he wanted to start telling, he wanted to start talking and telling his daddy what, 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 what he had done. And his daddy let him get out that much. And then he, he hugged him. Fathers hug your sons. Fathers hug your sons. Parents hug your children. Don't be scared. I used to make my, my, my boys, they, when they were younger, they didn't mind. But when they were older, they got older. They got, but well, you better come over here. You better come over here. You ain't getting nothing out of me if, you, if I can't get, get no sugar. If I can't get no sugar, you know, uh, and they don't want to wipe it off. I don't care what you do with it after I get it. But, 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 but check this father out. He gets on this boy's neck. He hugs him and gets on that. And then he kissed him. Do your word study on that word kiss. Don't ask Google because he didn't just give him a peck. If you he was know how stank that boy was, you know how sloppy he was, you know how smelly he was, you know how wet, wet man. He didn't, he didn't, and you know the best way would have done it. It blew your kiss. <laughs> blew your kiss. No, the Bible says that that father kissed him, and it's in the imperative mood. Not, I'm sorry, it's in the uh, present active tense, which means he didn't just kiss him one time. He didn't give him a smack. He kissed him and 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 kissed him. He kissed him and kissed him and kissed him and kissed him. How do you act when your child comes home? He kissed him and kissed him and kissed him and kissed him. He kissed him and kissed him and kissed him and kissed him. Jesus was trying to show those those Pharisees and scribes and those publicans and sinners what God will do if you just stop acting like you got it and come on in and get it. He kept kissing and kissing and kissing and kissing and kissing and kissing. And then the little boy wanted to get out a little more. And he said, Father, I said, and he said, talk to the hand. He told his servant, boys, go get my robe. This is the illustration I was going to do. I was going to send Reverend Fanny back there to get my robe, and I was going to come, and I was going to put it on somebody. But this social distancing thing got me hindered. It got me hindered. It got me hindered. You can't do everything you want to do, but get it in your head. He put that robe on. That robe says, you are, you, 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 you are welcome. That robe says that uh, you now are accepted. And then he says, uh, Get, bring him the robe, bring him the ring, bring him a ring. That ring says you now have authority. Uh, you could sign the father's name. Uh, let, 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 let. He said, and listen, bring some shoes. Get, get some Reeboks. Bring him some shoes. The shoes was, was, was evidence to the rest of the world that he's still a son. You see, only slaves were barefooted. Only slaves could not have shoes. And the, and the father was trying to make sure that the world knew that he still had sonship. He had access. There he is. He has the father's approval. There he is. He has the father's authority. There he is. He has access. And then he says, what? There is a, there is a, Y'all from the country, y'all know this. Yeah, we out there and sweat out. They raise hogs and cattle and herds and, and got, it, but there's always this one cow that's raised and raised and raised and raised and raised until there is a special occasion. And that's the cow that they told him to go get. Told him to go get, go get the robe, go get the ring. Go get the rebox. Go get the roast. Because we're going to rejoice. We're going to throw down. Going to throw down. Now, I know we got to go to Sunday school. But finish reading that. Because everybody was excited except the elder brother. Lost in the house, and y'all leave him like that. Y'all, y'all, y'all let him. Y'all, y'all like to pick on little bruh, but little bruh, his daddy said this. He was dead, but is alive again. How do you act when a sinner come to Christ? How do you act when a backslider turns around? 
How do you act when somebody you know has lived low? And I don't know, I don't know when you listen to that older boy's story, when he starts, when he starts going off on his daddy, you start asking the question, how he know that? How he know what the little brother was doing? Mm-hmm. Come on, man. Come on. <laughs> Everybody blessed by the word of the Lord today. Yeah, I just thank them for helping me this past Wednesday night. They so helped. Oh, bless the y'all Lord. Y'all heard all y'all stuff, didn't you? Mm-hmm. All right. So now is the time in our service where we turn and we say, is there anybody who has never accepted the Lord and Savior as your Savior? Never accepted the Lord. If you've never said yes to his passion, never said yes that I believe that God is the father of Jesus and that Jesus was obedient all the way to the cross all the way to the grave and his father raised him to the from the grave and I am standing and I'm raising my hand and I'm making it known that I don't want my life to be my own I want to turn it over to his plan of salvation for me I want to turn over myself and I want to say Lord I want you to be the head of my life and if that is you and you're in this building then you get to wave your hand and somebody will let you know about the Lord. If that is you and you're on the internet, then you get to look at the number on the screen and you get to call and you get to say, I gave my life to the Lord. And guess what? The script today, the text today says, and be merry after each story. It says, would you not be merry? Would you not rejoice? And so we're going to rejoice with you. Now, we have a second appeal, and that appeal will say, if you are, do not have a church home, if you do not have a place of safety, somebody that's praying for you, somebody that's teaching your Bible study, somebody that's meeting you at the place, whether you are on Zoom or whether you're meeting in person and you're studying the Word together, where you're praising together, if you don't have a place of safety, then I want to say to you that the Bible based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace is a place of safety. You have a pastor here that will pray for you. You have a pastor here that teaches you. You have a pastor here that teaches others. You have a pastor here that will say, it is Bible based, Christ centered, and Holy Spirit led. So come on and be in the fire with us. Now, the last appeal says, if you are unsure, If you're unsure if you've ever said yes, if you're unsure if you don't have a place of safety, then we can help you in that area too. So if you'll just follow the instructions on the screen, and if you are here, there are people here who will help you in those areas. So are you safe? Say yes if you're safe. Uh Uh-oh. If you're safe, say yes. That means you have a church home. Okay, are you saved? Say yes. Uh Uh-huh, see, you waiting on me to put that first. Okay, are you sure? Say yes, if that's you. All right, so give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Now, I want to let the fathers know that as you exit the building and everybody else, that when you exit the building today, you will be able to go to the express line because we're doing donuts for daddies today for Father's Day. So everybody who is a father, a step-in father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, you can just go to the express line and get your donut and coffee. And we're not going to leave anybody out. But if you are not a father, then there will be stations for you as well. You can pick up your donut and get your coffee as well. We are doing donuts for fathers as a way of saying happy Father's Day. Amen. All right. Amen. Amen. Let me just uh, say to you today, uh, please be in prayer with uh, Brother Frank White and Anissa Love and their entire family. Um, Brother Frank White is very ill himself and um, he needs our prayers. He needs our prayers. Sam, he's he's been where you've been. You've been where he is. And uh, he's not taking visitors because he is very he is very uh, uh, susceptible to 
to getting germs. But uh, Sam, I'm going to get his number to you. I want you to call him because I think you could be a breath of encouragement to him in such a time as this. This, this, uh, this past Wednesday, I was at the uh, bedside of his wife, uh, Sister Mary White, and uh, uh, we were praying that she would make it through the rough part of uh, her, uh, her illness. She went home to be with the Lord early Thursday morning. Miss Mary White, our director for our children and youth, pray for uh, that family. Uh, services are being planned for next Saturday. Um, uh, Wilson's funeral home has uh, charge of her services. As we learn more, we'll share with you in morning manner, and we'll also do uh, a, a text message to everybody. But we just keep having one round after another of the Lord bringing us home. I think it would be uh, uh, to all of our good is to make sure that you are moving in the direction that God is because you won't get a well done a good and faithful servant if you haven't done well. Uh, I'm looking forward to celebrating uh, Miss Mary White's uh, homegoing service. Uh, she fought a good fight, uh, which she's going to be sorely missed. But uh, it ain't time for us to feel sorry. It's time for us to shout and thank God she's not suffering anymore. Amen. <laughs> We are getting ready to depart from this place. Um, once again, anybody blessed by the word, you get to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, we're going to remind ourselves that we're on the prayer line each and every morning at 6 a.m. So please, 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 not only you dial in 813-980-0559, but you call somebody else and then say, you know what? We're joining each other on the prayer line this morning. We're going to start our day together in the word. And then we have our Bible study on Wednesday morning at 930. And on Wednesday evening, we begin our Bible study in prayer. So you can join us. Both of them are on Zoom. And if you don't know the information for how to join, then you can go to the church office and get that. All right. So this is how we're doing it. We're first going to say our... Um, benediction and then we're going to give the instructions for how you exit please don't forget to pick up your donut and your coffee as you leave and fathers may you have a happy happy father's day god bless you all right please stand our father and our god lord we love you so very much we thank you so very much for this word that you gave to us that it be planted in our heart, that we be ready to walk it out, that we be ready to share it as we depart from this place and never from your presence. From each other's prayers, we never depart. We say thank you, God. We say we love you. We say you, we adore you. It is in the precious name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Everybody say amen. All right, these are your instructions. If you're on the outside aisles, you're going to turn and face the wall beginning at the front, you're going to walk with your, um, with your offering. Please remember to maintain your distance as you walk, coming the first, and then you're going to go out each of the side doors. Now, as they are doing that, those of you who are in the middle, you can split. You can either have your choice um, those on this side can turn and face the wall. When that last row on that size goes out, you can go out. Those on this side, you can turn and face the wall. When that last person on that side goes out, then you follow them. We're going from the front to the back. Make sure you have a fantabulous day. God bless you. There you go. Thank you.
Thank you.